are so happy that you are here watching. We have a word for you directly from heaven. So if you would join us and be blessed this morning. So if you have your Bibles, let's open up to Genesis 37. I've had the story of Joseph on my mind and my heart for a really long time. So when I got asked to preach, I knew exactly what I was going to talk about. And as you guys know, I like to like read a lot of scripture because I want to get the full context in there. (laughs) I try to get the full context in there. Otherwise, I'm just giving a gist and then I'm having to explain it. So I'm just going to read, but I'm not reading all of Genesis 37. I'm going to skip around a bit. But we have it. We should have it up. We got it up on the screen so you guys can follow along. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. Now, Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves, which is like wheat, in the field. And behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I, your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of, jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in his mind. So <clears throat> I want to pause there real quick. I thought it was interesting that the Bible said his brothers were jealous of him, but the father kept the saying. The father was rebuked him and was like, dude, shut your mouth. But in the back of his mind, he was like, hmm, I wonder what that's about. And I, it kind of made me think of a little story. Um, not too long ago, Sterling, you know, he was renovating a house and he had hired out a couple people to help him do just small knick-knack jobs like around the house. And there was one guy that he had hired and he asked the guy to come over to our front yard to help unload a bunch of stuff from the trailers and tools and things. And it was really strange because that morning that he came to our front yard, me and Zeke had just woken up. We were sitting on the couch and Zeke opened up the curtain just randomly. He didn't even know anybody was outside, but he opened up the curtain and looked out and saw daddy and this, and this guy. And he turned around and he looked at me and said, mommy, he's a bad wolf. And I was like, what? Like, that was really weird to hear. And I just kind of was like, oh, no, he's not. And and then later on, like two days later, Sterling told me I had to let this guy go. He he showed up with drugs in the house and like all these random things, you know, and I just don't want any trouble and blah, blah, blah. And I told him, I said, you're you're not going to believe this. Two days ago when you guys were in the front yard, Zeke looked out the window. I've never seen this guy before. And Zeke called him a bad wolf. And it just made me think of that, you know, the, as a parent, sometimes God will use your children to speak to you in like little ways and you can, you know, you can kind of blow it off. Not everything has meaning, but then sometimes, sometimes we keep that saying in the back of our mind. <clears throat> okay, moving on to the next story. So Jacob told Joseph later on to go get his brothers. His brothers were out working and it goes on to say they saw him from afar. They saw Joseph from afar <clears throat> before he came near to them. They conspired against him to kill him. They were so jealous of him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him and we will see that and we will see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben, Reuben was the firstborn son, heard it, he rescued him out of their hands saying, let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their land, out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty and there was no water in it. <clears throat> so just a pause, because if I don't say this now, I won't remember to say it later. But it's interesting to me that almost every story in the Bible is like a mirror of Jesus. It's kind of teaching us about us, but it's also teaching us about Jesus. It's teaching us about now, but it's also teaching us about then. So it's kind of a mirror. It's a reflection. And it's interesting to me that Reuben was the firstborn son 
And Joseph was the last born son. And Jesus was God's first son. And Jesus is also the last. He's the beginning. He's the end. And Reuben, the, what, the firstborn son, stuck up for the lastborn son. And then I also found it interesting where it said the pit was empty. They took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty and there was no water in it. And it reminds me of the scripture, you know, where Jesus goes into hell after he dies, right? The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Just interesting. <clears throat> then they sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Jesus was sold for 30. They took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, It is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons, all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Sheol is death. It's where they, the Hebrews believe that the spirits lived after we died. Thus his father wept for him. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. So this message is lessons from Joseph. I just want to talk about Joseph's life and lessons we can learn from Joseph's life. So if you have notes, write down number one. God is always blessing you so that you can be a blessing to someone else. Amen. When God gives you a vision of prosperity, of power, of blessing, of increase, yes, it's for you. But don't let your pride mistake it as something that God is doing in favoritism. Because when God is blessing you, he's blessing many others through you. <clears throat> Jacob said, no, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Jacob fully intended, fully intended in his heart of hearts, believing that Joseph was fully dead. Jacob fully intended to spend the rest of his life mourning over Joseph. What is something in your heart, in your mind, right now, when I said that, that you thought, yeah, no, I have sealed the deal. This is what I will fully believe until I die. There's something in each of our hearts, in each of our lives, that we have given up fully on. That We have said, nope, God just doesn't want that for me. And we have said, no, nope, I will go down to the grave mourning about that one. But God is here to say to you today, it's not over until I say it's over. So lesson number two, what we think we will never get over, what we think God will never replace or never restore, God sees the finish line. God sees the end of the story even when we're stuck in the middle. <clears throat> what we think we will never get over, what we think God will never replace or never restore, God sees the finish line. He sees the end of the story even when we're stuck in the middle. All right, moving on to Genesis 39. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of the Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. When God is with you, he will seat slaves with masters. He will take what man esteems as worthless and set it up on high. Um, there was a time in my life, and me and my brother, we were in high school, and my mom and my stepdad had just got divorced, and so the last few years of high school were pretty intense emotionally for me and my brother and my mom. Um, 
And financially, they were terrible. We did not have a lot of money. Um, and I remember my brother going to my mom one night. And, you know, my mom's trying to pay all the bills. She's just got a divorce. She's trying to carry everything on her own now. I had just become Missy McCounty, and I'm like, da da through the town, and then I go home, and I'm like, ah, you know. So I'm trying to carry that. For me, that was a big load at the time. And my brother, you know, he's growing into his, his manhood. He's trying to establish something with himself. He feels like he has no fatherly support, no financial support. And I remember one time, he went into my mom's room, and he just started weeping. And he was like, I feel like I, all my friends are getting ready to go off to college, and they all have a plan, and their dads are all backing them, and I have nothing. I have no money. I have no, he just let it out. I have nothing. I have no plan. I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, and he's just like bawling his eyes out. And I was just kind of sitting in the background watching it and just thinking, man, this is a poopy situation. What do we do here? Like, this is not ideal. And uh, my mom, being the woman she is, she's like, well, okay, you've had your cry. Now let's get up and let's go apply for some scholarships. Like, come on, we're going to do this. Like, you're not going to stay there. So, yeah, so she took him down to a computer, and he just started applying and applying and applying for a scholarship after scholarship. It took, like, he did it for, like, six months. And then finally he got a note in the mail from, like, some random military. My stepdad had been in the military, and because my stepdad had gone to war and he was a child of someone who had gone to war, he got a scholarship. For, he got, like, yeah, he had paid for his first two years of school. And so we got invited to, like, a scholarship honorary dinner. And we didn't really know what it was, but it said to dress formal. So we got all, you know, nice and pulled out our best formal clothes. We, him and I drove up to, I think it was in Tucson. And we, we pulled up, and it was, like, 6 o'clock at night. And we did not, like, again, we came from, like, nothing. We, we had never been in a situation like this before. But it was, like, one of the nicest hotels in Tucson. And you've got all these, like, Audis and the most expensive cars rolling up. And I was like, okay. We're like in our little 1990 Impala. I'm like, all right, let's go. We got this. And so we walk in and there's like all these top generals from the military and all kinds of different leaders from all across the world. And we walked in and it just, it brings me to tears to think about because it was just like God's favorite. I don't know how it happened, but we got sent, set up with like the general of the time. I, I can't remember his name, but he was like the general of the military we got set next to him. Like, whoever was ushering, they're like, hey, we just, there's no seats left. You guys can sit right here. We were right up at the front with the top dog. Yes. And I looked over at my brother when we sat down in tears, and I was like, you know what, Jazz? I said, you were destined for greatness. Do not let what the devil has tried to do in our whole entire flip in life tell you that you don't belong in this seat. You belong in this seat. You belong owning this seat. Like, you don't just belong as a guest. You own this seat. And so I want to tell you this morning that you own that position. Why? Not because of you. I'm not supposed to be clapping. Not because of you, but because there is something coming. There is something on the way where God is going to use that blessing that he's placed upon you to bless so many more people. You are called, you are allowed to walk in that blessing because it goes so far beyond you. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. You might be the underdog, but you're the one carrying the blessings of God in your work, in your neighborhood, in your house. Maybe, maybe you're in a house where there's no other Christian in your house. Maybe you go to work and it's just a constant uphill battle. Maybe you feel like the underdog, but don't forget when you walk in that room, you're the one carrying the favor and the blessing of God to them. In the same way that the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph, the Lord will bless everyone around you because you have this favor. You are a Christian. You have the blood of Jesus running through your veins. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. 
Now Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me, but he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though he, she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went into the house to attend his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to make a sport of us. He came here in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home, and then she told him this story. The Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make a sport of me, but as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. So lesson number three, no form of isolation, setback, or false accusation against your character can stop God's call over your life. The word says that no weapon formed against you can prosper. Does that mean that the weapons aren't going to come flying? No. Does that mean that the battle's not going to happen? No. Does that mean that the war is not right in the middle of where you're at? No. But does it mean you're going to dodge every single bullet? Yes. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. In fact, the weapons formed against you are the very things that are putting you in position for God's promotion. Amen. The very things that are coming against you are the very things that are going to line you up right in the right spot for God's promotion. Because if Joseph didn't brag to his brothers, if Joseph didn't, God knew that Joseph had that pride in him. God knew that Joseph was going to be like, well, I had a dream and y'all were bowing down to me. God knew, but if Joseph had not have done that, his brothers wouldn't have thrown him into the pit. And if his, his little firstborn brother wouldn't have had the characteristic of compassion for his brother, they wouldn't have taken him out of the pit and sold him down. And then they sold him, and then they, God knew Joseph is a handsome man, that girl's going to come after him. And if, if, <laughs> and if God didn't do that, then the wife wouldn't have come after him, he would have never been thrown in prison. One thing after another. So sometimes we might look at our life, sometimes I... I get overwhelmed sometimes because I'm very humbled that I even get asked to get up here and speak because I still know five-year-old me. And sometimes I'm like, how did I get here? I just have to take a minute and take it in because I'm like, how, how does God trust me with the honor of getting up here and speaking to you ladies? Like to me, that is a huge deal because I know me, I know where I came from, I, I don't have any, you know, I can't tell you like these are all my credentials or anything like that. I just, I'm very blessed. God will use the things in your life that you might look back and feel like you just had pushback after pushback after pushback after pushback, and yet all those pushbacks are somehow putting you in position to be a blessing. So, so we don't have to read 17 chapters. Pharaoh pulls Joseph out of prison to interpret his dreams for him. That's the next thing in the timeline. And then Joseph predicts his dreams, and he predicts that there's going to be a famine in Egypt. Joseph helps him store food and for the people and for the animals. Joseph's brothers and his family are starving from the famine. And then they receive a word that Egypt was surviving, so they sent out to Egypt to beg for help. No one knows that Joseph is even still alive or where he even is. So lesson number four, God will send the very thing that once used to push all the wrong buttons. God will use that very thing to bring redemption to you. Never close God in a box in your own mind. So, as you know, many of you know, I, I, I've already told you my mom got divorced twice. 
my real biological father, he cheated on my mom, and there's just all this childhood drama with my father, and back and forth, you know, it was just like the gist of all the, the father things going on throughout my childhood. About four years ago, after my first son was born, I really started to understand, like, what it means to love your child, and I just couldn't fathom how my dad could have, like, left and done all that, and I just kept feeling like the Holy Spirit say to me, reach out to him, reach out to him, but I was just so stubborn. I didn't want to do it because I'd already done it 10 times, and he had failed me anyway, and finally, I just went, okay, Holy Spirit, fine, whatever. I was in California one day. It was at my cousin's wedding shower. My dad lived 10 minutes away, and I hadn't texted him in years, and I finally said, hey, I'm in California. You want to meet up? He goes, that's so funny. I have the day off. Yes, let's meet up, so we ended up going to lunch. For the first time in my life, my dad bought my lunch and walked me to the car and paid for my valet parking and all that stuff, and um, he, he walked me to my car and he looked at me and he just started bursting into tears. And he said, I am so, so sorry that I was not around. And I said, Dad, I wouldn't change anything. And I know you're sorry and I so forgive you. And I'm sorry that we didn't get to make those memories. But I wouldn't change anything because I would not be who I am today had I not have gone all through all of that. And me forgiving him at the time he wasn't a Christian, about a year later, him and his wife and all my brothers are now saved and going to church. So I know we got to wrap up, so I want to read the last scripture. Are you guys okay if I go a couple minutes over? Okay. Genesis 45, then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. Oh, I skipped something. So Joseph's brothers... He sends his, his brothers come to get help from Egypt. Then Joseph, they don't know he's Joseph. Joseph sends his brothers back and forth, plays a little mind game with them just because he can, given what he's gone through. And he sends them back to get Jacob, their father. And then Genesis 45, then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants when they all came back. And he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and the Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Can you imagine from their perspective, having spent your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, probably your 50s, thinking that you have killed your brother? Can you imagine the weight that that would put on you. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. Can you imagine the weight that would have been lifted when you heard, come close to me? When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there'll be no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve you for a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler over all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near to me. You, your children, and your grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and all you have. I will provide for you there, because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, so can my brother Benjamin, that it really is who I am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor according me in Egypt and everything you have seen, and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him, weeping, and he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterward, his brothers talked with him. When the news reached Pharaoh's palace that Joseph's brothers had come, Pharaoh and all his officials were pleased. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Tell your brothers, do this, load your animals and return to the land of Canaan, and bring your father and your family back to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you can enjoy the fat of the land. You are also directed to tell them, do this, take some carts from Egypt for your children and your wives and get your father and come. 
Never mind about your belongings, because the best of all of Egypt will be yours. That was said to the very brothers that threw Joseph in the pit. Never mind about all your belongings, because the best of all of Egypt will be yours. Joseph is a mirror of Jesus, and we are a mirror of the brothers who betrayed him. Even in our sin, our pride, our envy, our thinking that we know better, even in our betrayal to our Creator and who our Creator has made us to be, even then, He uses all of it to bring us life and life more abundantly. Repeat after me. Say, never mind about all my belongings because the best of all of Egypt will be mine. Amen. Do not let your past, do not let what you're currently facing, do not let the battle that you see before you tell you that God is that God has left you God has not left you he's only lined you up and the best of all he's got is promised to you why? not because of you because you said yes to Jesus when he called on you Everything works for the good of those who what, who love him and are called according to his purposes. That's the only requirement. God is with you today in everything that you do. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are enough, Lord. We thank you for who you are. We thank you, God, that you have put us where you want us, Lord Jesus, and even though at times it might feel like the refiner's fire, Lord, you're shifting the puzzle pieces around. Your word says that before you do a new thing, you announce it to us. And we might not see or hear the full announcement, Lord, but we see the shifting, we see the battle, we see the challenge. But you're doing something new, Lord. You know the future that we don't. And so quickly we assume that this is what God has, this is it. We assume. But if we look back over our lives, almost everything we assumed really never happened. But you happened, Lord, and you have put us where you want us, Lord Jesus. And I ask that today, Lord, that we could position our hearts to delight ourselves in you, not in our circumstance, not in our lack, not in what we think we deserve or what we know we deserve, but in you, Lord Jesus, that we could shift our hearts to just focus on you and watch the favor of God follow. We love you and we thank you for everything that you are. In Jesus' mighty name. If you're watching online, God bless you. Have a great day.